Hello, and welcome to Talk the Walk. I'm Azam Khan. The HKSAR government has said growth will slow in the second quarter, attributing to factors like the slow economic recovery on the mainland. Regardless, the city's finance chief, Paul Chan, has stressed that more creative ideas and more innovative strategies to create unique experiences to adapt to new spending habits is necessary. He added that more discussions with industry leaders will take place, but perhaps expanding the consultation to budding startups and to youth to help think outside the box should also be included. How has Hong Kong fared in reestablishing its status as Asia's world city in the face of weak external environment? My guest today has nearly 34 years of experience in the city's civil service, including former assistant director of social welfare. She is also currently the chairman of the Business and Professionals Federation of Hong Kong, Rachel Cartland. Mrs. Cartland, thank you so much for taking the time. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Um, so Chief Executive John Lee recently came back from uh, his trip across Southeast Asia as part of his um, outreach to reaching out to um, international stakeholders. And um, there was some fruits that was bared from it, um, a lot of agreements that were signed um, across different sectors. So can you talk about the importance of Hong Kong trying to reconnect with um, these different uh, regional partners and providing assurances of stability to the world? Well, I think it's super important and really refreshing to see because I think that's part of the world that we've rather ignored in the past or not paid a, a great deal of attention to. And um, these are very vibrant economies nowadays. And they're also, of course, places that we do have these natural ties with. I mean, with Singapore, perhaps it's been friendly rivalry for some time, but it's great to see us getting out there and stretching out a hand of friendship there. And Malaysia and so on with lots of uh, Chinese uh, communities and shared history, it's really great. And I think it's an important thing to do because very unfortunately, um, some of the communities with which you might more traditionally have had links, uh, the big places, the US, the UK, the EU, um, are now really mired in negative thinking about China and Hong Kong. So I'm afraid if we're going to make any headway, we have to look for some new directions. Um, and the government has spent a lot on trying to uplift the spirits of the community since the pandemic and the last few years. Um, and it's gradually getting back to its pre-pandemic levels and different metrics, um, the unemployment rate being one of them. But what are some other aspects that the government should focus on um, moving forward? I think we've got some very difficult times ahead. I think Paul Chan is quite right to urge caution over the economic situation. Um, we built up a tremendous reserve, a tremendous financial reserve, and compared with almost every other country around the world, we're really lucky because we're debt-free. Um, and as he's pointed out, we could spend for a year, we could meet government expenditure for a year without having to raise new taxes. But all the same, our reserves are less than they were, mainly because we had to spend so much during COVID. And as also, as you said in the introduction, the Chinese economy on which we're so dependent on, which is so interrelated, is looking mm, quite flat, quite stagnant, not meeting expectations. So I think we have to be quite cautious now about massive new expenditure. So the government's going to be in a difficult position, not able to uh, reach out and just give things to people that they might, they might like. It's really got to mm, tighten, maybe not tighten the belt. We're lucky enough not to have to make massive cuts, but to convince people we can't have a great many new things. Mm. And there's still that very unique and, but difficult balance of uh, trying to focus on policies for the short term and also um, to get the economy back going, but also on long term policies. Is that still a balance that um, needs to be addressed? I, my own feeling is that we should be looking much more to the long term, medium term now. I mean, we've had these short term boosts, particularly in the consumption vouchers. Have they really produced the effect that was wanted? I'm not at all sure. Um, we're not seeing massive amounts of uplift in consumption internally. Both Hong Kong and China seem to be placing a lot of hope on that. And I'm not sure that that's really going to be justified 
Instead, I think we do have to go in for some really deep thinking about what are the best directions for Hong Kong to go in. How can we really find a very worthwhile future for ourselves that doesn't just create jobs, but creates quality jobs? Because one thing, unfortunately, that you can really see if you look at the figures is that for the last 25 years or more, uh, those at the top of the socioeconomic pile have done all right. They've taken blips uh, when there have been financial crises and so on, but their basic trajectory has been upwards. But sadly, the reverse has been true for those at the bottom of the socioeconomic pile, the grassroots of Hong Kong. Their real income has not been increased at all. And uh, we really got to find ways to give people hope um, if not for themselves, for their next generation. Right. Um, you meant because Hong Kong has always been reliant on its very established financial system and the financial sector. And as you mentioned, those are the ones that um, are fair and all right. Um, and the city, I guess their long term focus has been now that the city is trying to develop its its tech and trying to establish hubs and reach outs when you went to Southeast Asia. Um, for the future in that regard. But does that also leave a massive blind spot of the youth today and how we're going to equip them to be able to um, to learn different skills and to be able to thrive in different fields that are outside of um, the cities, in, outside of the sectors that Hong Kong does really well in, like finance? Yeah, I think in the, the slightly longer term, we're going to have to see changes. And that means that we're going to have to take some really critical looks now to do some really deep analysis of what's going to be the most profitable, not just in the sense of making money, but in producing a really thriving society. And um, obviously, I think not providing direct subsidies, because that's never been the Hong Kong way, quite rightly, but doing what we can to facilitate uh, that kind of healthy growth. And I would really like to see government reaching out, not just to um, business people and the legislative council and all these, but also to, to the great wealth of talent that we have in our universities uh, who will really perhaps be able to help us to think, think through what is there that's going to be the future, that's going to be useful, good for us, and how do we really translate that into something practical that can be executed for the benefit of everybody. And you still very much have your finger on the pulse uh, being involved, for example, in the Business and uh, Professional Federation. Um, but despite all this bleak uh, economic outlook, like the Chinese mainland one, uh, recovery, interest rate hikes, is there anything that is that we can look forward to? We've still got our terrific strengths that mm. everybody mentions that are worth mentioning again. Mm. You know, the rule of law, incredibly important, the common law system, um, the wealth still of talent here, I mean, it's been very depressing, really, to see how many people have left of all sorts of different kinds, uh, local people in, often in kind of young professional stage emigrating, uh, lots of expatriates finding the COVID restrictions too much to take and going to, back to UK, Australia, uh, USA, this sort of thing. This is actually, we can't disguise this or make things sound better than it is. It's been really damaging. But still, we have, we do have many talented people here and many people who are um, entrepreneurial, uh, ready to be creative and coming up with new business solutions and so on. As for the youth, um, yeah, let's have um, plenty of talking to people about uh, how they feel and so on. There's actually a massive amount of youth programming and so on. If you go to something like the website of the Youth Development Commission, I think you'll be amazed to find how many programs and projects and possibilities there There's are. A lot of different youth federations, youth groups, like you, like you mentioned, yeah. Yeah, but again, we can't underestimate how tough the last few years have mm. been for our young people. I think Hong Kong kids are actually very resilient and they have been resilient about uh, going back to school and restarting learning. But also what I see, I'm afraid, is that they're actually more anxious than ever. Um, it's a bit sort of unfocused. You could say it's a bit irrational, it doesn't make sense. 
there's such overwhelming anxiety about things like DSE, this feeling that if you don't get a certain mark in DSE, it's the end of the world. If you don't get into your certain preferred you know, college, your certain preferred course, life's over. Now, I think we all know that won't be true, actually, that there are always lots of different things that people can do. But perhaps the adults need to make those points more strongly, um, more clearly to the young people, instead of letting them sort of sink into this feeling that uh, there's only one narrow way, and unless they succeed in that way, they're in an absolutely dis desperate situation. Yes, Carla, and I'm going to pause you right there while we go for a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Rachel Cartland. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Talk to Walk. I'm speaking with Rachel Cartland, former Assistant Director of Social Welfare in the Hong Kong government. Um, Mrs. Cartland, I wanted to talk about your role as the chairman of the Business and Professional Federation in Hong Kong. Um, what are some of the some of the objectives you guys um, have on deck um, in the coming months? Um, well, generally, we're interested in the good governance of Hong Kong and actually making it as equitable and prof prosperous a society as we can, because we think those things go together. Uh, the Business and Professionals Federation has got a pretty interesting history. It came out of the Basic Law Drafting Committee, and some members of that in the 80s felt that they didn't want to just stop doing that job and go away, that instead they'd like to continue and um, think about topics that were for the overall benefit of Hong Kong. I got into it really through Sir David Akers Jones, who was my former boss in the civil service and a very dear friend of somebody I respected enormously for his dedication to the community. And uh, right up practically until the, the day he died in his 90s, he was thinking and planning about what would be good for everybody in Hong Kong. So we slightly rove around when it comes to topics. We pick on things that we think are important. We're very glad to see that this administration, the current administration, in some aspects is making us redundant in the sense that some of the things that we've been concerned about for a long time now seem to be coming to fruition. Uh, the public housing program is one. Uh, we've been very worried for a long time that, about the shortfall in public housing, but we can now see that the government is being uh, much more dynamic and has much more innovative with these new ideas about how con to construct quickly and with this new innovation of the transitional housing that we think is really worthwhile. Well, another thing that we're always concerned about is the operation of the Mandatory Provident Fund. We believe that is a good system for Hong Kong. It's better than the traditional old age pension of Western countries, but it has to be executed properly and generously. Uh, we've been talking for years about the need to give up the offsetting mechanism whereby uh, employers were allowed to offset things like redundancy payments again against some MPF. We felt this was incredibly unfair, and we're glad to see at last that this is now uh, something that's being uh, put right. Better late than never is all we can say on that one. Health is very important to us, the healthcare system, and also the elderly care system. So we're currently quite absorbed in looking at the primary healthcare blueprint. We entirely agree with the government's basic attitude that when it comes to health, prevention is really important. Better to get in uh, quickly and deal with people's health problems before they become so serious that they're going to need extremely expensive treatment if they're going to be able to be tackled at all. Um, we do have some issues about how that primary health care blueprint is going to be uh, implemented, but we're glad to be in dialogue with the authorities there, the health department and the health bureau have been very good to us and we have plenty of opportunities to um, exchange views with them. So uh, we're a, an organization that's very active. 
we're lucky enough to have lots of access to government and indeed to people in the industry and financial services sector too. Um, we'd like to see more members. We think uh, this would be good for a lot of people. And so we'll be working to encourage more people to come on board and join us in this, this, this mission. You think that um, getting more young members as well also would help uh, the cause, not just uh, with you guys, but across the board. <clears throat> like I mentioned at the top of the show, the need for thinking outside the box, which even the finance secretary was uh, stressing. But um, I think having more engagement from the youth in all of this would help. Abs absolutely. And, and too, with that bigger social issue of letting young people feel they're really part of the community because, again, we can't disguise the fact that there are still very deep social wounds dating back to 2019 and before. And they're only going to heal if everybody feels that they're a valued member of this society. Yeah. And the world is changing so much. The professional landscape is changing more exponentially than ever before. And only the young people have an idea of what that is and what that looks like. And it's their future. No, I understand that consulting, um, like, the, like the organization you're a part of, that's very much a, a common tradition in Hong Kong of former, of uh, these groups, think tank groups that consist of um, uh, former uh, civil servants like yourself helping to consult the government is a common tradition. But I wanted to ask you, the younger uh, civil servants today, do they reach out to um, veteran, veteran uh, civil servants for advice or for consulting on a on a more private level? Um, does that happen quite often? Mm, a, a little bit, you know, I mean, it's, it's certainly got it, friend, friendly links, as it were. I mean, mm. it, it was all, I love working in the Hong Kong government. It was a great organization. And one of the good things about it was that it was so friendly and somebody like David Akers Jones would totally go out of his way to make everybody in the, in the department from uh, top to bottom feel that they mattered. Um, but again, we've seen this really like very sad lack of dialogue over the past few years. And I'm afraid the civil servants became, in a way, um, they were, became quite shy of the people that they were actually meant to be helping or meant to be working with. So um, the new format for the Legislative Council, the District Councils, controversial in its own way, but let's hope that it's really going to operate well and that we're going to see, like, LegCo members and District Council members uh, not taking things uh, completely lying down, not rubber stamping everything, uh, but in indulging in some constructive criticism but a real partnership so that um, government and people can work better than they have been. Right. And I understand you, you wrote a, a book back in 2014, Paper Tigress, which you, di you dive into your uh, 34 years of experience in the civil service. Um, so when you, when you look back at that now and um, when you look at today, how would, what, like, some, are there any examples or things that you would want to see the whole, on a macro level, the bureaucracy sort of, evolve or adapt? It's so easy to just sink into thinking. Yeah. Wow, it was always so great. We did yeah. things so well, and these mm. guys, you know, don't not patch on us. And that would obviously be a mistake. Mm. Um, but I, I have actually very recently been thinking about some things that I think were done better in the past. Um, unfortunately, I've been thinking about this uh, Kaitak uh, debacle Right. recently mm -hmm. and I couldn't help contrasting it with um, what was done when the race course at Sha Tin was opened up because that was a mighty effort too um, because it required not just the race course to be built but also massive transport infrastructure to go into place and then the rather imaginative idea that there would be a park for people in Sha Tin to enjoy all as part of the scheme. And by and large, it all worked and it all came together on time. You know, I think, I think one of the really important qualities that civil servants need um, is imagination. And that doesn't mean that they've got to be full of wild ideas or even super creative. I mean, that could be not helpful, actually, at all, if you have people who've got too many wild ideas. But what you need to have is the imagination to think, OK, X is going to happen. 
How is that really going to operate? And what are the things that can go wrong? What are the things that we need as contingency plans and to make sure that the whole experience fits together well? So I think that's uh, one part of it. I'd like to see more imagination. And yet, although I said, and I believe, I don't want to think uh, civil servants should be over-creative, I think they should be ready to take bigger risks right. because that's really the besetting sin of civil servants. It can be really sad. People come in, they join the government, they're super intelligent, uh, they're super idealistic, but then after a few years, they just sink Rest into... Rest laurels. No, let's have no mistakes. Mm. And as we know, you know, the old saying goes, if you don't do anything, you won't make a mistake. Right. And But equally, if you don't do anything, you don't make any mistakes, but you don't make anything that's new and good. And civil servants mostly understand the problems that they're dealing with, but sometimes they're just too scared to take the actions that they should to put things right. You were Deputy Secretary for Recreation and Culture. Um, so, and the government recently has, has been uh, implementing different initiatives to get people to go out to the different uh, recreation centers. They had a free day the other day uh, for all its facilities to help promote exercise and health. Um, so uh, what did you think about that and what else can be done? It's great to see. And um, if you look at the arts and culture side, I mean, it's really unbelievable in some ways to think of the progress that we've made so quickly in terms of uh, both hardware and software. I mean, we never used to believe we would have a second orchestra. I mean, the Philharmonic was an amateur orchestra for a long time, and when that professionalised, we thought, that's it. Um, and people never dreamt that there could be opera, Western opera in Hong Kong, so on and so on. So there's been massive progress in those ways. The only thing I must say that um, I feel a little bit uh, heartbroken about or what um, worries me a lot is that perhaps not everybody can enjoy especially the arts things. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, for middle-class people, uh, the ticket prices can seem pretty reasonable. But if you're a family living out in the Northwest New Territories, um, it's really hard to um, put the money together to take everybody to a show or something like that. So as like the latest step or whatever, the next step, I'd like to see um, it action towards audience building. Um, partly to encourage people to go and appreciate the arts, and partly so people, especially children and young people, don't feel excluded, don't feel everybody else can do this, but not me. Um, we actually do pretty well in terms of school choirs, school orchestras, things like that, again, compared with many other countries. But I'd like um, everybody to have the experience of being able to go and see a, a really well put on show, uh, professional standards and so on. And um, if I could put in a little plug, one of the other things I do as a piece of voluntary work, I'm privileged to sit on the board of the City Chamber Orchestra of Hong Kong. And um, we specialize in some fantastic shows for the family. Uh, we've recently had a very successful uh, few days in London as part of a youth arts festival there, and our family musical Wild, which is all about animal conservation and has been a great hit in Hong Kong, was also very successful there. And I'd just like to see every child in Hong Kong, every young person, having the opportunity to see things like that, regardless of whether their families are well off or not. Mrs. Carlin, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Pleasure, really enjoyable. That's all for this week. I'll see you the same time next week. Goodbye.